Wonderful to see so many of you here this morning at this you know, fairly early hour. Wonderful but not surprising at all when you look at the person who is here to speak to us today. My name is Anita Arnand. It is my very great pleasure uh, to be in conversation this morning with uh, Dr. Shashi Tharoor. Now we have a, we have a, 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 a playwright, or, a, or let's just say a reference to people, a certain type of person, a man for all seasons. And never was that term more appropriate than when applied to Shashi Tharoor. He's an award-winning author of 16 books, uh, a tombed two-term member of the Lok Sabha, the lower house uh, of parliament in India, a former UN Undersecretary General, and he has the velvetiest voice I have ever heard in human existence. <laughs> and believe me, I say that with a great deal of authority. I work for the BBC. I am surrounded by velvet and crinoline. So <laughs> please put your hands together once again and welcome Dr. Shashi Thoreau. Thank you, Anita. That was a great intro. Now, how do I live up to that? <laughs> well, you, uh, you will, I know, in spades. Um, let's just, first of all, you, you, are, um, you have had an extraordinary career, and it has taken very many meandering turns. But with this new book, you managed to do things completely head over heels. I mean, normally, we writers, we write a book, then we take to the road, and we do speeches. You did it the other way around completely. Just, just talk us about through the genesis of, of how this book came to be. Well, I, got, I, I was invited by the Oxford Union to deliver, uh, to participate in a debate that the students had come up with. It was their topic, their theme, and their, their topic was that Britain owes reparations to her former colonies. Now, I wasn't terribly thrilled about the reparations argument, largely because it's so difficult to quantify the damage Britain did to her former colonies, but I felt that it was necessary to make the case. So I skirted the reparations thing by saying, you know, maybe one pound a year symbolically for the next 200 years to make up for 200 years of colonialism. But in the speech, I talked about all the wrongs of British colonialism in India. Uh, on my side in the debate was the Jamaican High Commissioner talking about what they'd done in Jamaica and so on. So it was, it was a, all the colonies were, were up for, for debate. But somehow when my speech was posted on YouTube by the Oxford Union, the blessed thing went viral. And somehow there were three million downloads in the first 24 hours and it just became crazy and people just kept coming up and talking about it and so on. And even the Prime Minister acknowledged it. It became a, a bit of a course celebrity. My publishers called me and said, you've got to make a book out of this. And I said, for God's sake, what's the point? Everyone knows this already. To which he said, no, they don't, because if they did, your speech wouldn't have gone viral, which seemed to make sense. So I said, all right. And, uh, and of course, you know, a 10-minute speech is one thing, and a, a 330-page book, which is what it ended up being, is quite another in terms of the amount of research and substantiation required. But um, really, if it weren't for that speech, I wouldn't have written the book. Mm. Can, can I just have a show of hands? How many of you have seen that Oxford Union bombastic speech? So you are now officially meme-tastic all over the world. I mean, it, it is a fact. And, and let us you know, sort of remind ourselves, you know, we are in the country where they chucked tea over the side of a ship uh, to register the disapproval of the British. So you know, have you been surprised at the international reach of the message that you had? Yes, I mean, the fact is that the, um, the, the, the international reach, I, I don't know whether we really looked closely at whose hands went up, but I suspect there were mainly people of Indian origin in the audience. <laughs> it's international in that Indians are in many nations, but I think the appeal was principally, as it turned out, to Indians who sort of saw themselves, as it were, in a mirror through what I'd said and, and began to get a sense of their own history that perhaps they weren't paying attention in class, or perhaps they never heard it in class, depending on, on where they studied. And so for many of them, there was this sort of shock of recognition that this, this is something they should have known, but which seemed to pull a lot of things together that they had some impression about. Where, you said, um, you know, when your publishers approached you, you said, look, everybody knows about this already. But the process of sitting and writing and investigating a, a book, you, you're chatting to your family. <laughs> my sister was supposed to be listening to my son oh, I know, this is I'm terrible. in with my son. I know, it's a very, so. very sad story. Uh, his brilliant, brilliant son is, is speaking at the same time. Uh, when you were doing the research for the book, however, were there things that leapt out and surprised even you, that you thought you knew the story, but actually 
you had not come across this before? Well, there were two kinds of things, Anita. One was certainly the level of detail. Because, you know, for example, in my speech, I said 15 to 20 million people had died in British famines, uh, essentially because that was what I dimly remembered from my student days. When I did the research, it was actually 35 million at a conservative estimate who died totally unnecessary deaths because of famines caused and worsened by British policy. Um, and, and, for example, the realization that this wasn't just acts of God or Mother Nature, but deliberate policy, uh, and that the same policy was undertaken by the British in Ireland, except that in Ireland, when people started dying in this British-created famine, they at least had the option of jumping onto ships and sailing off to America. Indians didn't, so they stayed in India and died. But this, this was a, a startling thing. The entire logic of British famine policy, which rested on four pillars for 150 years. Number one, thou shall not give charity because charity encourages idleness and idleness is bad. Number two, the Malthusian principle, <laughs> if the land can't sustain the population that's trying to live off it, people must die. That's how the right population balance is struck. Number three, the laws of the free market must prevail. If you want to purchase grain from places where people don't have enough to eat because you want to fill the bread baskets of London, that's the way the market works, tough on those who have to die. And number four, fiscal prudence. Thou shalt not spend money thou hast not budgeted for, and thou shalt never budget for a famine. So with these four principles, the British actually presided in both Ireland and India over the deaths of people. And, and they did so systematically. So this was, to some degree, I mean, I, I read, for example, a book by a British professor, Mike Davies, called Late Victorian Holocaust, that go into, goes into far more excruciating detail uh, about what the British did. And what was interesting was, you know, this is, uh, Professor Davies focuses on the la latter part of the 19th century, when, because of all the liberal thought and the Enlightenment thought that had come into Britain in the 19th century, the British public was waking up and developing a bit of a conscience, which is why suddenly, for the first time in the second half of the 19th century, the British find themselves having to be hypocritical. They try and justify colonialism in insincere language about the benefit of the governed, while privately admitting to themselves it was nothing of the sort, but the PR starts occurring at that time. So when the famines happened, the Orissa famine of 1866, for example, when two or three million people died because of British policy, and there were incidents, I recount one in my book, where an Englishman tried to help somebody dying in front of him and was told by the British he would be deported if he ever helped anyone again who was dying, that it was against British policy. So after that, there was such a stirring of conscience in Britain that they decided they would have to have some sort of relief organized for the next famine 10 years later. And when that famine was organized, they said, no, 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 we can't encourage idleness. That principle remains solid, so it'll be work camps. These people will work for whatever grain we can give them. And according to Professor Davies's book, the food that was given to them was lower than the rations given by the Nazis to the concentration camps of Buchen in Buchenwald before they were exterminated. That was what the British thought was a work wage to be given to people who had to, to, had to, to work to stay, to keep body and soul together. So that sort of thing was deeply, deeply chastening. Um, then there were things I hadn't mentioned in the speech but did know. For example, Churchill's reprehensible conduct uh, in the famine of, of 1943, which is pretty late in the day actually to, to be like this. Um, the Churchill took decisions to export grain from Bengal when there'd been a terrible drought and people were starving there. And, um, and he said, you know, it's all their fault anyway, these Indians, for breeding like rabbits. Um, people started dying, and dying in rather significant numbers. Uh, and Churchill said, well, I hate Indians. They're a beastly people with a beastly religion. Ships from Australia were docking at Calcutta port laden with wheat, and Churchill personally ordered that they would not be allowed to disembark their wheat where people needed it, but would sail on to Europe, not to aid the war effort, which was the later British excuse, but actually to bolster buffer stocks held in reserve for a possible future invasion of Greece and Yugoslavia. And people kept dying. The death toll reached 4.3 million people, literally dropping like flies on the street. And when conscience-stricken British officials wrote to the prime minister saying, your decisions are costing these lives, all Churchill could bring himself to do was to write peevishly in the margin, why hasn't Gandhi died yet? And this is the man the British want us to hail as some sort of apostle of freedom and democracy when clearly he was one of the more appalling racist 
you know, people responsible for genocide in the 20th century to stand comparison with the other awful genocidal races of the 20th century whom you and I can name. Yeah. Now, these were the kinds of things that I think needed to be said and had to be pointed so, out. So one of the things that's been very interesting, and we'll, we'll, we'll sort of, um, because there's so much that's so interesting, and, and you will have to sort of forgive, but this is the, the nature of the beast at a, at a literary festival, it's going to be sort of seen through the prism of the eye of the person who is talking to you, who read the book. And, and, and let's stay with predation for a while, the predation of the British. But just before we do that, you brought up Churchill, which has has been the recent news hook because as you um, have alluded to, you know, Churchill, I come, you, you probably can tell from the accent, I, I'm born and brought up in England, and Churchill is constantly and consistently held up as one of the greatest Britons who has ever lived. In fact, we had a, a competition for the greatest uh, Britain and he beat Jeremy Clarkson of Top Gear. That's how important <laughs> we think Churchill is. Um, <laughs> Time magazine did a, a global poll <laughs> mm. at, in, in 2000 for the, the world human being of the century and he beat Gandhi to it. Right. So, so that shows you how effective propaganda can be. But when you say a thing, and I, let's just sort of you know put the the politics uh, to this, because this is what it has suddenly had. Your your book has had a number of eruptions. It's like some kind of sort of um, uh, smoking Krakatoa. It keeps going off uh, in different places at different times. Uh, but the eruptions at the moment are because you have said, you know, Churchill was like Hitler. Now a lot of people swallowed deeply and uncomfortably at that. No, you didn't say that just now. Is that because maybe you back away from that or, no, or no, do you no, stand I'm, by I'm that? I'm happy that? to stand by it. Hitler killed six million people. Churchill killed 4.3 in India alone in one episode. It's a difference of degree. It's not a difference of kind. In the 1920s, Churchill openly said he was in favor of using poison gas on uncivilized tribes, by which he meant the Iraqis of Mesopotamia. And they dropped poison gas from the air Against, against human beings. And that's what Churchill was doing. I mean, Hitler was doing inside concentration camps. But it's a difference of degree. It's not, there's no great difference. I mean, this was an awful human being. And the lava continues to flow. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad we've, we, have, we have established that. In, in politics, though, I mean, you are, you are a politician. And this is an era, again, just before we get sort of in, in, in more detail into some of the really startling revelations. There were revelations to me in the book. Um, but this is an era where in post-Brexit Britain, uh, all our politicians are saying how they want to get closer to countries like India. You know, India is the future. We're going to we're going to sort of team up with India. India is going to be our new trading partner. When you keep evoking that kind of image, um, is it not actually running counter to what would be good for the two countries? Forgive and forget the past to be the past, etc., etc., etc. You know how that works. Well, we are a forgive and forget culture, notoriously so. We don't hold grudges for very long. Um, and certainly we, there are no national grudges against the British, never were. Um, I'm trying to say to the Indian people, as far as forgive and forget is concerned, forgive is a good thing, right? Because holding bitterness and hatred inside you actually corrodes you far more than the object of your hatred and bitterness. So as far as I'm concerned, forgive, but don't forget. Because forgetting is doing yourself a disservice. I often say to young people in India, if you don't know where you've come from, how will you appreciate where you're going? You must have a sense of civilizational continuity, what your civilization has experienced, before you have a meaningful contribution to make to how it should go forward. And it seems to me, when you look at, 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 at all of us as human beings, we're curious about our parents, what their background is, what their story is. We are curious often about our grandparents. Maybe it stops about there. But the fact is that in terms of a society's living experience, to be curious about and familiar with the last 200 years, it seems to me as basic as being curious about, about one's own parents. And that's, that's something that I feel is necessary. Now, you, you did say that, you know, there are some in Britain today who want to revive these links with the former colonies. Indeed, there was a slightly silly idea floated in the media last summer about Empire 2.0, and I was asked about that on the BBC, and I said, Empire 1.0 was such a bad idea, why would anyone want to resurrect or repeat it? But the fact is that um, the important thing to understand is that the terms of trade of Empire 1.0 would not be available anymore. Uh, Britain, for example, uh, talked about having brought the benefits of free trade to her empire. But in fact, it systematically destroyed the free trade on which India had thrived for the preceding 2,000 years in order to impose its trade at the point of a gun and to 
keep down a captive market for British goods in India. That kind of thing isn't available. It, if they want to negotiate a new relationship with the countries of the Commonwealth, they're going to have to give as much as they take. Mm. Let's talk about uh, uh, some of those things. So, uh, again, one of the really eye-opening details in the book was the systematic, deliberate, venal dismantling of industries I hadn't even thought of. For example, ship shipbuilding. Can you can you speak to that a little bit? Sure. Let me start with textiles simply because that is the most egregious case. Because for two thousand years, India had been the world's leading manufacturer and exporter of textiles to the point that in the Roman Empire, you'll find accounts by Pliny the Elder of debates in the Roman Senate uh, decrying the fact that so much of Rome's gold was being sent to India because of the taste of Roman women for Indian cottons and, and muslins and linens and so on. Um, uh, indeed, when the British came to India, one of the things that attracted them was the prospect of, of getting into the textile trade on the ground floor because India was the world's leading textile exporter. Uh, the, the famous... Uh, gauzes, for example, light as woven air, it was said, so fine you could pull an entire sari through a ring. And, and these textiles were so prized by the aristocracy of Europe that I found accounts in the 16th, 17th, and 18th century of English shopkeepers trying to pass off shoddy European-made cloth as made in India because made in India was the cachet, the, the hallmark of high quality and, and more desirable, more sought after, and more highly priced. So British came in initially to trade, purchase these things. They weren't doing very well. There was lots of competition. And then they realized it's far better to trade at the point of a gun. But it was even better still, since they had English cloth to unload, to destroy what India was producing in order to force Indians to buy English cloth. And so they proceeded systematically to break looms and, and break down and break up the factories that, uh, that, that Indians were, were mass producing. It didn't textiles. stop at the factories, though. I mean, they, the human cost. They did some, I mean, the, the, the oh, ghastly yes. account of the weavers. Um, well, there was at that. least one episode. There are some British historians who challenge the veracity of the general claim, but we know of one episode documented by a Dutch observer at the time, 1772, in which the British cut off the thumbs of the weavers so that even if the broken looms were repaired, they couldn't weave again without their thumbs. Um, it was really quite grotesque, and they did all of that, destroyed the industry. Then whatever little survived, they imposed punitive tariffs and duties on the export of, uh, of cloth from, 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 from India, while lifting duties and tariffs on the import of British cloth into India. Since they controlled the ports, they were able to do that. That was textiles. Shipbuilding is another great story. India was a major manufacturer of ships. A very high quality craftsmanship, again, accounted for by contemporary British accounts of how good the craftsmanship was, woodwork, uh, brasswork, and so on for the fixtures and fittings. And the, uh, the ships were made in India of teak and mahogany, which lasted 25 years on average, whereas the average European ship made of fir or pine in those days only lasted six or seven years. So the British initially were excited by the idea that by controlling large chunks of the Indian coastline, they could manufacture their ships in India. <coughs> but that resulted in shipwrights and, and dockyard workers and so on being thrown out of work in London. So the British promptly passed an act of parliament that forbade ships made in India, whether made by British companies or by Indians, from plying the lucrative international routes to places like London. And because they couldn't sail there anymore, that shipbuilding industry collapsed as well, and, and, and the British shipbuilding industry thrived. And right up to the 20th century, they wouldn't let Indian shipping companies compete with them. It was quite extraordinary how the legal system was stacked against Indians, the physical control of institutions, ports, and so on was stacked against Indians. Steel industry, for example, India was a, a major manufacturer of steel going back centuries again. The technology invented in India in, in what is today Karnataka was called in Canada Ukku steel, which the Europeans mangled into wood steel, W-O-T-Z, leading people to assume it was an East European invention. It wasn't. It was, it was from India. The Arabs came and borrowed the technology to make the famous Damascus steel. And when the British first came to India and engaged in battles with Indian soldiers. When they killed an Indian, they would dismount from their horses and steal his sword because his sword was made of much superior steel to what the British were able to deploy. Um, and yet, um, uh, they not only systematically destroyed that industry, they refused to let Indians manufacture steel. And when the modern steel industry came into being in, in, in England and in Europe in the mid 19th century, Indians weren't allowed to build steel plants. Jamshedji Tata, 
the great industrialist spent about the last 20 years of his life battling for permissions to set up a steel plant. He finally got it done, though he didn't live to see the first steel ingots coming out of that plant. But a British official of the day, the then chairman of the railway board, sneered that he would personally eat every ounce of steel that an Indian was capable of producing. It's a pity he didn't live long enough to see the descendants of Jamshedji Tata acquire the remnants of British steel when they bought Chorus a few years ago. Might have given him a bad case of indigestion. You, uh, I mean, you talked a little bit about, you know, the, the Weaver story. You said there was backlash about that. And, uh, of course, a lot of these messages, I mean, they are, it is a polemic, and therefore it, it stirs tensions. It, it causes ripples of, of applause here. I've heard cheering. I've heard people stamping feet. It's a very rare phenomenon at a literary festival. You make people fairly wild. Uh, but the, there is also... Um, <laughs> No, I'm not even joking. It was more like being at a rock concert at Jayapur this year than it was a literary festival. Um, but, but there has been chafing, and let me put some of the chafing to you, that, that, that in a polemic, perhaps there has been exaggeration of the bad and ignoring of the good. First of all, to that general point, what do you say? And then we can get into some of the specifics. Well, I mean, as, as, I've, as I've often said, I mean, the, 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 what's now become a cliche, in fact, I think I heard it used yesterday again at this festival, is that you're entitled to your opinions, but you're not entitled to your facts, right? You have to mm -hmm. have facts that are verifiable. And my facts are all extensively uh, footnoted uh, in 30-odd pages of endnotes at the end of the book. Now, it's entirely possible that credible historians can pick another set of facts, facts put them together, and, and try and, and, and come up with an alternative portrait. I've hedged by saying in my book in various places that, of course, what I'm describing here happened, but it was not the only thing that happened. I don't go into, into much exonerating detail because mine is an argument. It is structured like the Oxford Union speech as a debating argument against what the British did. But I point out, for example, that not every British administrator was <coughs> racist or arrogant or imperialist or genocidal or anything else, and that there were good people who did good things. And I've given a few examples. Sir Arthur Cotton's uh, irrigation of the Godavari Delta, for example, which is still remembered in gratitude a century later with statues of the man all over the, the irrigated fields of the Godavari Delta, this kind of thing. So there are good stories as well. But my book, I will admit, is not about the good stories. It's about the overall picture. And one of the reasons that I was anxious to, 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 to come up with that overall picture is because we've seen in the last 15, 20 years a heck of a lot of the other side of the argument. You've got the best-selling books by writers like Neil Ferguson and Lawrence James and Andrew Roberts, particularly in Britain, which have essentially pretended that the British Empire was a force for good, in Ferguson's notorious phrase, a jolly good thing, capital J, capital G, capital T, and that it was there uh, to lay the foundations for the globalization from which India is profiting today. Curious that they never made those arguments for the first 50 years of India's independence when we weren't profiting so much from globalization, but the moment we started doing well, they took the credit, which was rather striking. But anyway, um, so I thought it was time for a bit of pushback, and, and that's why, uh, given that that side of the argument has been so extensively uh, depicted in their books, um, I gave the other side. Now, I do want to say that some of the arguments that I made, I am familiar with, and I reject them. So, for example, one classic argument, in fact, the core argument against my thesis of the deindustrialization of India uh, and Britain growing and, uh, at the expense of India, is, well, it's not our fault. You missed the Industrial Revolution, and we profited from it. That's the, the classic British response. To which my answer is, we missed the Industrial Revolution. We missed the bus for the Industrial Revolution because you threw us under its wheels. And that's something which I've tried to demonstrate, not only through the accounts of the industries they destroyed, but through the entire panoply of regulations. For example, in the section on steel, I talk about how they had rule after rule that made it very difficult for India to be able to, to, to develop its own steel industry. C certainly. I mean, you, you, you say you, you have hedged in certain places and, and given some credit. But there is one matter that you have not hedged at all, which is the argument that from the 1700s, India was one of the richest countries, if not the richest country in the world. And because of the predation of the British Empire, it became a, in your words, poster child for the third world. Um, within that argument, a lot is talked about taxation. And one of the things that uh, I have heard in the pushback, and you understand 
I live in the land of Ferguson and Roberts and Murray and... and now, Ferguson really does. <laughs> All of those. Um, so, uh, you know, one of the things that they do talk about is that, you know, you cannot ignore what India was like. It, to, to say that it was the golden era of unicorns for everybody and rainbows in everyone's garden is to ignore the fact that when the Marathas were in charge, they had uh, a taxation policy called the Chote which was to take a quarter of whatever anybody made, that often became a third of what anybody made, and you ignore that. You ignore no, those things. I don't ignore it. In fact, um, uh, uh, let me stress to begin with that, um, that as far as the, uh, the, 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 the loot and depredation are concerned, um, there is very little doubt because this was all documented extensively contemporaneously. So in the 19th century, people like Dada Dabai Nairoji, who started off as an Anglophile and then wrote a book which in a very polite way spoke about the title was Poverty and Un-British Rule uh, in India. Uh, in other words, saying to the British, you're not living up to yourselves because this is what you're doing. He documented the drainage of resources from India through taxation. An English writer called William T. Digby published a 900-page book, all of which I have on my Google Drive, uh, in 1901, in which he calculated to the penny on the basis of British accounts every year of the miscellaneous uh, 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 amounts that they transferred to England, how much money Britain had actually drained out of India. And it came to a very substantial corpus. I don't want to mention a figure here, but it's in the book, and I, I don't remember it anymore to the, to the last penny, but he does calculate it. Uh, in fact, the British took the word, the Hindi word, loot, into their dictionaries as well as their habits. So it really was, I mean, they, they purloined as much as they could quite effectively. But on taxation specifically, Anita, it is true First of all, that though India was the richest country in the world in 1700, 27% of global GDP, and the second richest in 1800, 23% of global GDP, and that the Mughal emperor Aurangzeb uh, had revenues that exceeded those of all the crowned heads of Europe put together, 10 times the revenues of Louis XIV in Versailles, whom every European is trained to think of as this incredibly opulent monarch. Aurangzeb's revenues were 10 times that. So though all that is true, it is also true that it was unevenly distributed and that obviously there were people who were richer than others and, and there must have been people who were relatively poor. But I say relatively poor because there are no contemporary accounts and there were lots of European travelers coming from the 15th century onwards and Arab travelers as well. There's no contemporary account of wretched poverty to rival what we saw after the British took over. In fact, India was a relatively sophisticated society of flourishing farms, of thriving industries, urban centers that were really well populated, merchant banks, a very sophisticated financial network, the Jagat Sates and so on in northern India. You had all of these artisans, workers and so on, a sophisticated society, not a land of, of primitive starving peasants that the British like to describe. And if anything, British, the British destruction of this actually made all of that worse. So for example, the cities of Dhaka and Murshidabad, which were capitals of textile production and were major urban centers of the 17th, 18th century world, were actually depopulated by the British. And the British, by destroying the livelihoods of workers, weavers and so on in these cities, drove them to the countryside where they were trying to be forcing themselves to live off the land and the land couldn't sustain so many people because the actual division of population and labor was far more rational before the British came and interrupted it. When it comes to taxation, yes, there were examples of 25% taxation, 33% taxation in some cases, but the British taxed at 75%, 80%, even 90%. And these are all documented by the Brits. They were extraordinary in their, in their uh, rapaciousness. And when Warren Hastings, the East India Company's Governor General, was impeached in the House of Commons, we have highly respected British voices like Burke and Sheridan going into grotesque detail about the exactions committed by the East India Company's officials in order to extract money from peasants who couldn't afford to pay it. Uh, some of the stories are so gruesome, and I have quoted one or two in my book, that the playwright Sheridan's wife famously swooned to the House of Commons hearing them. It was that bad. And, and the truth is that um, uh, there is a lot of evidence for the next 50, 60 years, because the House of Commons held hearings going right up to the 1840s, which I have quoted, that Indian peasants were fleeing 
British controlled lands for the few lands still under princely control because life was so much better under Indian princes than it was under the British. See, see I, again, I, I, I'm not surprised when there is pushback from British historians. I'm not at all because, you know, it, it, it attacks the very notion of what Britain thinks of itself. Um, but when there is also pushback from, from Indian historians or historical eco economists, I'm, I'm interested. I I'm, I'm genuinely want to know what you think about this because there are people like Rajat Dutta from JNU who say, you know, this, this certainly the there was rapaciousness, but there was also investment in capital uh, uh, projects. You've got, uh, what's his name, Irfan Habib, who says, you know, it, it was bad, but it, well, there were also very many very good things. That when the Marathas taxed at 25 or 33 percent, they took the money and they wore nice clothes. When the British taxed at that much, they made railways. I hate, I hate bringing no. up the railways. <laughs> I know you hate bringing up the railways, but, you know, they made, they made universities, they all for their own selfish ends, but they, these the things are left behind, which if India had been left to its own device, is it showed no uh, appetite for leaving such things behind. What do you say to that? You know, Taj Mahal wasn't left behind? Or <laughs> they, uh, no, there were, there were things left behind. Inevitably, you build things that last, they last beyond your time. But you know what I mean? It's but, infrastructure, but no, yeah? let, let, me, let me come back to that very specific point you made because it is an important point. The fact is that every single thing the British built in India was built to serve British interests, to enhance British profits, or to improve and, and enhance British control. These were the three motives for everything they built, and they built the minimum. It has been demonstrated, for example, that the bulk of taxation in the princely ruled India before the British came was spent on things like improving roads, bridges, caravanserais for people travelers to stop, and so on. Yes, there was some conspicuous consumption, but that conspicuous consumption used Indian artisans, Indian jewelers, Indian clothiers, and so on, so the money was spent in India. The bulk of the British money, that is the taxed money, over 80% was sent back to England. They spent the minimum in India they needed to spend to keep control of the place. So they, they built the minimum one-lane roads, they built uh, government buildings that they could live in and they could work out of to run their government. They were not interested in building universities for the masses, just for a very, very small elite who would serve as accomplices in the act of governing India, not uh, uh, any commitment to general education. And the railways, Anita, the railways were built for two clearly minuted purposes, one to extract resources from the countryside and take them to the ports to ship them to England, and second to send troops into the interior to quell any possible unrest. That was what the railways was all about. And they did so with a wonderful colonial scam, that is that they guaranteed, on the basis of Indian taxpayers' money, they guaranteed double the highest rate of interest then available for any British government security. So that the single most profitable investment an Englishman could make in London from the mid-1840s to the mid-1870s was to invest in the Indian railways. The Indian railways cheerfully spent money hand over fist because the costs were being paid for by the Indian taxpayer. One mile of Indian railway being built in those days cost nine times what the same one mile was, was costing at the same time in the US or Canada. And what is more, it was described at the time as private profit at public risk, except the private profit was all British and the public risk was all Indian, the Indian taxpayer. So please don't tell me the railways were a gift from the British. You know, I, I just so didn't want to go to railways because the, the railway thing, it's immediate. I don't know how many of you people watch uh, Monty Python, but there is... In the life of Brian, you know, the, 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 what have the Romans ever done for us? Railways is the equivalent of the viaduct seen in that uh, particular argument. But, but just, I'm going to take some questions from the audience. But just, um, if the British had never been in India, what would India have been? Well, you know, I, 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 I was prodded by my publisher to indulge in a bit of counterfactual speculation. And that, I will agree, is the weakest bit of the book because obviously... My counterfactual guess is as good as yours or anybody else's. Uh, my guess is if you look back at the broad sweep of Indian history um, for 3,000 years, you're looking at a country which rulers have tried when they were at their peak to unite in one territorial unit. So if you go back to Chandragupta Maurya in the 3rd century BC before Christ, 
He controlled about 90% of the Indian subcontinent, including what's today Afghanistan and, of course, Pakistan. And um, if you then go to the Mughals, Akbar to Aurangzeb, they controlled about 95% of the subcontinent. And every Indian ruler was strong enough tried to do all that, but they were held back by the limitations of communications and transport in that day and age. If you look at what the British accomplished, I am convinced that they accomplished what anybody in power at that time with the advantages of modern communications and transport and modern weaponry would have done in their place. If it wasn't them, it could well have been the Marathas, who at one point had swept through much of the country, indeed were stopped by the British in Calcutta with the famous Maratha ditch, and were uh, essentially holding the Mughal emperor in Delhi as a kind of hostage. I mean, he was nominally the emperor. They paid obeisance to him, but they really told him what he could do. And you could see in that the germs of a potential evolution of a constitutional monarchy with the Mughal emperor as a figurehead, the Marathas controlling the, the civilian rule, as it were, and then eventually the movements for democracy that everyone else saw everywhere else in the world coming up. I mean, you've got very few examples in Asia of countries that were never colonized, but both Japan and Thailand evolved in those ways. Monarch, uh, strong military rulers underneath them, the military rulers gradually giving way to more and more democracy, uh, of course, more successfully in Japan after the Americans bashed them up and conquered them, uh, less successfully in Thailand where the military are back again in power. But some variation of that would have, it seemed to me, been a more plausible outcome in India. But history is history. The colonization happened. I would much rather not have been colonized, but we have to live with the consequences of that and, and make the best of it. But I'd like to look at the past whole with my eyes wide open, embrace the past as the past and leave it in the past. We can't undo the past. I, I, I often tell people, particularly of the political persuasion of our current ruling party, I'm in the opposition, as you know, that you can't revenge yourself upon history. What has happened has happened. But the beautiful thing about history is history is its own revenge. The week my book came out in Britain, Theresa May, the then newly elected prime minister of Britain, was planning a visit to India, and she was going on from Delhi to Bangalore and Hyderabad and Bombay, looking for Indian investment in her feared to be faltering post-Brexit economy. So I said, there's my case. History is its own revenge. <laughs> now, there, there's a lady who's held up 10 minutes. So do clap, clap. We've got always time for clapping. Uh, is, it, is it five minutes to questions or five minutes till the end of this whole thing? Oh, five minutes of questions. Oh, that's great. Um, I'm going to start taking we're questions. On till we are. We are. We are. We are. We are. We're good. We're good. I'm going to ask one more thing, and then we're going to take questions. So, if the microphone people, where are my microphone fairies? Are we here? If you could please get to two of the people um, with their hands up, that way we can go to questions straight away. But my last to you is, um, you know, we're celebrating the 70th anniversary of independence, and those people who um, stand up for the British Empire, they say, look. What did you guys do when you, we left, you know? We'll look at the metrics of any civilized society. Take one, for example, child mortality rocketed when India was in charge of itself. That's what they will point to. No, they will point to right, tell me, tell me why, <laughs> tell me why. No, in fact, um, uh, when you think of where we were in 1947 when the British left, we had 90% of the population living below the poverty line. We had a life expectancy of 27 we had a literacy rate of 17%, 8.8% for women, and we had extremely high infant and mother and maternal uh, mortality rates, all of which have been transformed. Certainly, we are unhappy with where we are. Mm -hmm. We today are 79% literate. We ought to be at 99%. And we, so we why are, aren't we are you? Working. Well, because because we started off at 17, that's why. Mm. Uh, you know, we, 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 our, our life expectancy has gone from 27 to 69, which is approaching the biblical three score and 10. So we're, we're getting to where the British ought to have left us. We are, uh, of course, uh, 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 dealing with a poverty-stricken population of about 25% of our population, which is awful, and that's 25% poor people too many. But... It's a lot better than 90%, which is where we were when the British left us. So in terms of every yardstick, I've given the exact numbers, for example. The British ruled India for 50 years after, the, uh, after electricity started to be installed in the world. And they electrified something like 1,500 villages in those 50 years. 
If you take the first 50 years of India's independence, they electrified something like 500,000 villages, not 1,500. So, I mean, I, I've got the wrong numbers because obviously I'm, I'm not looking at the text right now, but the exact numbers are in the book. My point is that there was a huge difference because the British were ruling in the interests of Britain and the Indians were ruling in the interests mm -hmm. of Indians. We talked, for example, about uh, you saying that when the Indian rulers taxed, mm -hmm. they wore fine clothes. Yes, but as I said, Indian artisans and jewelers flourished. Do you know that of the British civil service salaries paid in India, on average, 85% were remitted back to England? So they bought their fine clothes and perfumes from Paris and London. How did that help India? Mm. So even, if you like, elite exploitation within independent India, by and large, at least happened to support Indian industry. And you've seen the revival of Indian industries across the board, including luxury industries and, 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 and clothing and jewelry and all of that. And that's, to some degree, the answer. I don't say that we are in any way perfect. In fact, I keep saying in the book throughout that we nothing in the book exonerates or excuses our failures of governance or our failures of development since independence. It's not meant to. But at least one should remember where we took off from and what we had. You know, you, you were literally trying to rise from the ashes mm -hmm. after the British left. Um, and so, and this is really a very short answer because then we're going to take a lot of, there are a lot of keen people here. Um, we, we, I've recently done a book with lovely William Dalrymple who's over there about the Koh-i-Noor and about this demand to, from, from seven different countries to get the diamond back. Um, is sorry enough for you or should there be actually some material diamond shape <laughs> caravan that comes back towards India? Well, as you know, since you're the co-author of the book on the, on the Koh-i-Noor, uh, when uh, David Cameron was asked about it as prime minister, he said, sorry, it's going to have to stay put in Britain because if we gave that back to you, the British Museum would soon be empty. Uh, and that's true. The British Museum, I mean, other, a Hindi name for it would be Chor Bazaar. I mean, you know, <laughs> a thieves' market. Because uh, everything in these museums in London... I've been purloined from other peoples in other countries. That's, that's how the British have... And I point out to the British, by the way, that you know, you've got all these wonderful museums, including an imperial war museum, but you don't have a museum to imperialism. You don't actually have a museum that people can go to and see the whole story of what your colonial history was all about and what you did to your former colonies. And it's high time somebody built one. Just as they have a statue in the heart of London to the animals that fought in the two world wars, there isn't a statue to the 1.3 million Indians who fought in the First World War and the 1.7 million who fought in the Second. Not one statue. So anyway, that's, that's all a different story and we'll, we'll talk about that later, but is sorry enough? Uh, I would say, and perhaps others will ask things that will give me a chance to tell you a longer version of the answer, but you wanted a short one, that because, as I said, reparations are difficult to argue for since any payable sum in reparations would not be a credible sum and any credible sum would not be a payable sum, so why ask for money? I think moral atonement needs to be paid and you can start off by teaching your children the truth about their own history. Uh, you can do A-levels in Britain today in history without learning a line of colonial history. That ought to change. That is true. And you can say sorry to the Indian people. I even have the perfect occasion for it at the back of my mind, but I'll wait to see one of you ask a question well, that gives me an excuse to tell you get, that story. Let's get some of those questions. So who has the microphone? Who's holding the conch at the moment? Over here. Could you stand up, please, when you ask the question? It'd be lovely to look in you, your face. Hi. Hi. I am one of those millions who have uh, read your Oxford, heard your Oxford speech. Thank you. I have one curiosity. I have read several places that among all the colonial powers like Britain, Portugal, France, Spain, etc., Britain was democracy at home and had a free press at home. And many press reporters from England came to India. Why didn't they report on any of these things? I fully believe what you said. But what happened? Was it some kind of hypocrisy or they didn't know no, no, that? No, they, they did report. In fact, I quote them. There's a particularly outstanding book by a Sunday Times journalist in 1908, 1909, Henry Nevinson, who traveled through India for, for six months or something and reported in great detail in this paper. Material was available. I mean, in fact, one of the things that I hope people will admit about my book is that it's full of contemporary judgments, very often by English people about what was going on. So it's not that there was nothing available. At the same time, the British learned the art of saying one thing and actually doing another. Uh, and and you know, only a few people were naive enough to believe their press releases. So that when, for example, 
um, uh, Queen Victoria proclaimed that the uh, administration of her government in India would be thrown open to Indians. Lord Lytton, her favorite poet, the Viceroy of India in the 1870s, wrote a private letter to her, which has surfaced, of course, 70 years later, saying, of course, you do realize that while we say that publicly, we can't really give Indians any genuine responsibility. You do appreciate that. Or in as late as 1928, the British Home Secretary, Sir William Johnson Hicks, says bluntly, you know, there's all this talk, particularly in missionary circles, about us ruling India for the benefit of the Indians. We know that's all hypocrisy and can't. We seize India by the sword, and we rule it by the yardstick, and we shall continue to do that in the interests of Britain. Quote, unquote, unquote, word for word. So the British were very honest with themselves behind closed doors. There was a lot of all this propaganda. But even at the time, people saw through it. So when that flatulent voice of Victorian imperialism, Rudyard Kipling, wrote his preposterous poem, <laughs> The White Man's Burden, an Englishman, within three days of its publication, wrote a brilliant riposte, sadly unknown, called The Brown Man's Burden, which I have quoted extensively in the book. Because it seemed to me that it's important for people to realize that even at that time, the racism, the imperialism, the jingoism, the swagger, the fraudulent hypocrisy of the imperialists was known, visible, and punctured at the time. But these were the voices of the decent few that were drowned out by the imperialist many. Let's take another. Uh, the lady here in the green. Yes. Thank you. So my question is a two-part question. It pertains to language and literature. We've already discussed that if the British had not come to India, maybe you would have been a scholar in Malayalam and we all wouldn't be here today, right? <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> the first part is when you and I were uh, starting school in Delhi, or in India rather, um, we were, um, you know, the, India was a teenage country, so omissions in our education were, you know, forgivable and uh, understandable. So here we are, 70 years old, India is a mature country in terms of literature. What, if anything, has been done to uh, bring out uh, uh, Indian literature. Is it still Euro Eurocentric? Uh, our education. Are we t studying the classics, Kalidas, okay. whoever? Okay, we, we we get we get the question. Very good question. And the yeah. second question. Very is, briefly, if you will, because okay, there are lots of okay. people want to ask. Uh, what is it about the psyche of India that 70 years after independence we still harbor this uh, English-speaking caste system? So those of us who didn't go to the convent schools and who don't enunciate English perfectly are still subject to discrimination, job and socially. Thank you very much indeed for the question. Okay, on the first one, the answer is yes, there has been a lot of progress, but not enough. So for example, um, we don't teach Kalidas in the English medium schools. And we should because he was, I mean, only sadly a fragment of a fraction of his work has survived, maybe at a rough guess 5%. We hear references to other plays that haven't been found. But that 5% in good English translations are in every respect the equal of Shakespeare or any of the great writers of, of world literature. And Indians don't know him as well as they know Shakespeare. And similarly, just as in the West, uh, you, you know, st students used to study the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, in, their, in their young days in school, we ought to be studying the Mahabharata and Ramayana as products of our, of our civilization, and we don't. And those things, I think now people are waking up to the fact that you don't have to be, shall we say, uh, a Hindu chauvinist or whatever to take pride in these accomplishments of ancient India, and it seems to me that we need to revive some of that. On the question of the um, English-speaking elite system, it's a peculiar, it's a very uneven pattern. Um, on the one hand, thanks to the uh, India becoming a more and more globalized economy, English has become a language of opportunity. And so for a lot of people, learning English enhances their job prospects because uh, a lot of them are going to be working for companies will have, which will have English-speaking customers, clients, and so on. Not even necessarily people in the Anglophone world, but people for whom English is a second or third language, but a language they have in common with their Indian suppliers or Indian service providers or whatever. So English has de facto become a working language for large sections of people around the world, not just in India. And so Indians say, let's take advantage of that. And indeed, why shouldn't they? Because the British uh, colonialism has at least left us with enough people who speak enough English to set up institutions to teach these people. Um, in other areas, it varies. For example, in the political domain, English is now a major disadvantage. The, the principal language of parliament is increasingly Hindi. And people from non-Hindi speaking states find themselves seriously handicapped, either having to listen through very inadequate translations or feel cut out 
of the, the popular discourse, the jokes, the references, the literature, and so on. Overwhelmingly, our prime minister speaks only in English, and many ministers in the BJP government respond to questions asked in English only in Hindi. Our prime minister speaks only in Hindi, is what I was saying, I beg your pardon. So this is what's, what's increasingly happening. In popular entertainment, Hindi has already won. Bollywood is, is not only the popular cinema of India, but even in non-Hindi speaking states, uh, Bollywood films continue to have an appeal and that's spreading Hindi throughout the country. So it would be wrong to suggest that English again prevails. In certain domains, higher education, universities, and uh, multinational corporations, companies doing national and international level business, English does thrive. And one of the main reasons for that is it's still a language that links the elites of India across geographies. When two Indians meet in a city, their first instinct would be to suss each other out in English before they figure out if they have another language in common. And that's, again, natural because if you speak an Indian language that that person doesn't speak, you don't actually succeed in communicating. Right. Okay, so we are going to, let me tell you, we're going to take a question from that gentleman there whose hand is about to fall off his shoulder. Um, that, and then we'll come to the wings. And we'll come over here, and then we'll come to that far back side. Yes. Yes, Shirchi. Uh, thank you so much for that enlightening information. Uh, I have not read your uh, book nor the Oxford thing, but I'm going to definitely watch it. But my question is, you said two things about the British rule in India. Forget and forgive, right? We, cannot for we can forgive, but we cannot forget. And one thing that they have given us, uh, British, that it is playing out till today in India is the concept that they introduce of divide and rule. This divide and rule thing since British came before that, uh, India has lived under different uh, uh, empires. Okay, so what, what is your question? It's a good point, sure, right? So sure, what I'm going to ask the question. question. Yeah. So they lived pretty peacefully, yeah. and when the British came, it changed. So my question to you is, uh, since you're in the opposition, what are your thoughts and what should we do to defeat this and get out of this mindset that the British have implanted in India? Thank you very much. Excellent question. In fact, you said you're going to listen to the speech. The speech does not address this issue, but the book does extensively. There's a large chunk of the book devoted to divide and rule, which was a very conscious, deliberate British policy. Um, even though retrospectively, and thanks partially, if not principally, to the British, there's been a tendency to see previous history in communal terms that Aurangzeb, for example, was an Islamist fanatic who oppressed Hindus or that Shivaji was a Hindu hero who fought Aurangzeb and so on. The fact is that Shivaji had Muslim uh, military artillery captains and, 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 and soldiers in his army and that Aurangzeb had Hindu generals and, and courtiers and ministers in his court. So uh, it, it was never monolithic Hindu versus Muslim at any stage. But when in the famous revolt of 1857, which the British like to dismiss as the Sepoy mutiny, the British saw Hindu and Muslim soldiers fighting side by side and under each other's command, under the banner of the enfeebled Mughal monarch against the hated foreign oppressor, they said never again, this mustn't be allowed to happen. And Lord Ilfenstein wrote a celebrated memo in 1858 saying, divide et impera, Latin for divide and rule, was the ancient Roman maxim and it shall be ours. And they proceeded as a matter of systematic policy to foment a sense of separate feeling on the part, particularly the Muslim community, since they were numerically smaller than the Hindu community, in order to create the sense that they were separate, distinct, and, and should fear being swamped by the Hindus. Uh, now, some of this was benign, helping Sir Syed Ahmed Khan set up the anglo Mohammedan College at Aligarh, that sort of thing, education, no problem with that. But some of it was deliberately malicious. And so, for example, when the Indian National Congress was set up in 1885 to be the voice of what very liberal elite Anglophone opinion, lots of lawyers writing polite petitions asking for the rights of Englishmen, um, their presidents in the first 20, 25 years included all communities, Christians, Muslims, Parsis, and Hindus, all served. And if the British really were sincere in their hypocritical pretensions of working towards uh, self-government for India, they would have co-opted this body and worked with it. These were people like them, as it were. Instead, what the British did was to create or help create and, and, and prompt the creation of a rival nationalist movement just for Muslims called the Muslim League. They partitioned Bengal, officially declaring it was in order to create a Mohammedan majority province in East Bengal. And when the Muslim nobleman, the Nawab of Dhaka, was first approached about this as a good Oxonian, he drew himself up and said, that's a beastly idea, I shan't stand for it. 
whereupon the British slipped him 100,000 pounds and he changed his tune. So it was, and I've given example after example of the British going out of their way to create the sense of separateness, to help finance it and encourage it in order to rule more effectively. But as I point out in 1947, the culmination of this tragic policy, when they'd even, for example, when they'd begun very grudgingly to hold elections with very limited franchise initially, uh, only one out of 250 Indians could vote, they still ensured that different religious communities, the voters were listed separately to vote for candidates of only their own communities on seats reserved only for their own communities. So they'd never have done that for the Jews of Golders Green, but in India, Muslims could only vote for Muslim candidates for Muslim seats, just a way of continuing to foment a sense of separation amongst them. So it was very, very systematic British policy, and it culminated in the horrors of the partition of 1947. What should we do today? I mean, obviously, the governing ethos of India since independence has been one of refusing to accept the divide and rule theory. We've said just because Pakistan has been created as a state for India's Muslims, uh, or some of India's Muslims, because many remained in India, we are not creating a state for India's Hindus. It's going to be a state for everybody. That's what our nationalist movement was all about. Uh, we now have, for the first time in power, in a majority of its own, a party that hasn't subscribed to that view, that does want to see a Hindu Rashtra. But they haven't yet created one. I think they're going to find it more and more difficult to do this. They're going to have to work with, if you like, the logic of the electoral marketplace, which brings in people of different communities, and they're going to find it necessary to work with everyone. So I'm still confident that as long as many of us continue fighting for it too, that India will not be reduced to a Hindu Pakistan. Uh, we Thank you. Um, we'll take one question from this side, please. Sorry, I'm making you uh, cover some ground there. Just uh, the gentleman there. Yeah. Hello. Um, the most posh elite game is cricket. How do you explain Indians' love for cricket in light of the racism that was inherent in the colonial era with the white country clubs? Right. Well, actually... Uh, there's a wonderful Indian sociologist called Ashish Nandi who memorably said, cricket is actually an Indian game accidentally discovered by the British. <laughs> by which he meant that the, the temperament, the quality, the skill, uh, skills required of the game and the entire nature of the sport uh, fit the Indian character so much better than they do the British. And indeed, our climate far better than the British climate, which is uh, an odd place to be cricket when, when it rains so much in that benighted place. But... Coming back to, coming back to um, uh, how do you justify it? The interesting thing about British racism in cricket was, while they introduced it merely to play amongst themselves, Indians took to the sport as a means of demonstrating their own sort of quote-unquote manliness, to use a Victorian term, to be able to hold their own against the British. If they were good at cricket, they felt the British would respect them more. And so it was a matter of great pride for all Indians, for example, when the finest cricketer in late Victorian England was an Indian prince who played for England in the celebrated rivalry against Australia and scored a century on his debut. So you had all of these stories which, which uh, I mean, there, there are accounts, uh, there's a, uh, I found a doctoral thesis somebody had written about how cricket and prowess at cricket was essentially a vital element of Bengali nationalism because the Bengalis were being caricatured as this effete group of effeminate babus who were only fit for clerical work. And they wanted to show that they were capable of beating the British at cricket. And how on one occasion in 1911, I think, when the Presidency College, which was full of, of Indian players, lost to the very colonial La Martiniere, that there was practically national mourning declared in Bengal because somehow these manly young men of Bengal had succumbed to these, um, these lily-livered colonialists. So, I mean, the fact is that racism was there, but there was counter uh, punching from the Indians to show their own fitness, to take the British on in their own sport. And of course, our love for cricket has gone up even more these days when we beat the R British pretty regularly today. Um, a forest of hands, but I'm afraid this over is now over. Um, but it is a glorious, glorious read. Uh, in Glorious Empire, uh, Shashi Tharoor will be signing the book in the bookshops. It is really, really worth your time. Please.